Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, just in case we have colleagues joining us from across the different regions of our globe. Uh, my name is Ronald Jackson, head of the Disaster Reduction, Recovery and Resilience Building team here at UNDP, and I'm pleased to welcome you uh, to the Ask Task Force 4 Peace Dialogues. Uh, today's dialogue will be addressing building resilience through disaster risk reduction action in fragile and conflict affected areas. The peace dialogues are being organized by UNDRR and DPPA. And of course, certainly we know that the world is facing a multitude of crisis and is falling behind on reaching the sustainable development goals with people in fragile and conflict affected contexts amongst the furthest behind on the way to attaining the SDGs. The frameworks and institutions for the prevention of disasters on the one hand and of conflict on the other have largely evolved separately, governed by different frameworks, managed by different institutions and conceptualized differently. Yet there is a recognition that linkages between disastrous management and sustaining peace and peace building need to be strengthened both in policy and practice to accelerate progress towards achieving the SDGs. This peace dialogue certainly will explore how disastrous reduction can support peace building and sustaining peace in humanitarian and fragile context. The session will highlight the findings of the midterm review of the implementation of the Sendai Framework for Disasters Reduction and share examples on DRR activities undertaken across development, humanitarian and peace sectors. Session will seek to engage a myriad of practitioners in a open discussion of evidence and practice and how DRR tools and approaches can support collaboration between humanitarian development and peace building actors. It will additionally seek inputs on possible next steps for enhancing collaboration across these sectors. I am pleased, therefore, to be joined by, uh, I would say, a uh, uh, distinguished panel of speakers who will take us through uh, today's agenda, which will be focusing first and foremost on setting the scene. And we will have a speaker from UNDRR who I will introduce soon, covering uh, the sort of uh, scene setting and then five discussants who will kind of dig into the the key issues and questions that emerge from the scene setting. Uh, I am joined by first and foremost from UNDR Ms. Sandra Amlang, who is the head of the Interagency Cooperation Unit of the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction. Uh, facilitating the implementation and monitoring of the UN Plan of Action on Disaster Risk Reduction for Resilience. Sandra has more than 15 years of experience in disaster risk reduction and resilience building, working in different regions across the globe from the Caribbean, Latin America through to, to Africa. Following Sandra, we will have five discussion, discussions, which includes uh, Amadou Sado, Sajo Bari, Peace and Development Advisor, um, with the UN Residence Coordinator's Office in Mauritania. Sajo is a professor of philosophy at the Sep Segep of St. Hyacinth and researcher in international relations in Canada. He is a former political advisor to the transitional Prime Minister of Guinea uh, and advised the mediator in the political crisis in Guinea. We will also have Paul Genou, environmental law specialist and moderator from UNEP in Haiti. Uh, Paul is an experienced legal advisor and mediator with 25 years of international experience in the private sector and international organizations with special emphasis on energy, environment and climate change. She's worked with UNEP in Haiti since 2018, first as head of office in the South and as leader of the Environmental Peace Building Initiative and coordinator of national Climate Security Group. We also have with us Andrea Decru, Climate Peace and Security Advisor at UNAMI in Iraq. Andrea is, has served as Climate Peace and Security Advisor with the UN Mission in Iraq since May 2023, supporting climate action that promotes peace. Previously, Andrea has also worked with UNEP across Africa, 
and she's first joined the UN with UNHCR as their Global Environmental Coordinator. We also have with us Celia Hall, Program Manager of Climate Change and Security, also with UNEP. Uh, she's currently leading the EU UNEP Climate Change and Security Partnership, which is working to scale integrated responses to climate related security risk at global and national and community levels. She's also the co-editor of the UNEP policy series on environmental dimensions of disaster and conflict. Uh, we will have as well Ivo Anaji Nabeng, who is a resident of the Mundi Ecology Botanical Center in Cameroon, working as a farmer dedicated to sustainable agriculture. At the Mundi Ecological Botanical Center, he promotes organic farming practices and educates fellow farmers on sustainability. We have certainly uh, a, a very diverse panel who will be able to speak to a, a number of the key issues. But before we hand the floor over to Sandra, just a few housekeeping matters. One, for you to note, the session will be recorded and made available on the YASC website. And two, your questions can be posed in the chat and we will get to them as time permits. Allow me then to hand the floor to Sandra Amlang, who will get us going on setting the scene on the topic. Sandra, over to you. Thank you very much, Ronald. And uh, first of all, I would also like to thank all speakers. It's great to have many speakers here and all the colleagues that have been involved and uh, in, with the UNDR, but also DPPA in preparing the sessions and the discussions over the last uh, uh, weeks and months on this topic and uh, also I think the what helped us also a lot in looking into disaster risk reduction and peace was uh, the conversation we had looking into the humanitarian um, humanitarian aspects and disaster risk reduction which we started uh, in 2018 and also thanks to all the the agencies that are involved in that I hope you can see the full screen and then I would go ahead so as a starting point uh, from UNDR side, we always enter from the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction. As you know, it promotes a multi-hazard approach, uh, looking at man-made uh, environmental biological hazards and also uh, natural hazards, as you know. Uh, the tricky part here is that uh, it does not so much uh, say the tricky part, because as of COVID, we know, everybody knows how complex uh, the risk landscape is and uh, how uh, the the data of systemic risk. So here we also have broadened the, the scope in terms of working with different partners, uh, looking into also societal hazards. So that's something that we are also looking into this peace sphere, looking at social instability and armed conflict. But I would like to highlight that this is not part of the overall mandate, but through partners, we are looking how can we approach this topic because it's very important also in the humanitarian development and peace nexus. Also looking when we look at overall risk considerations and risk understanding, and we do a risk analysis, we need to consider all different aspects, the multidimensional nature of risk. So that's the reason why it's important. Also, Ronald already mentioned, we are lacking behind the, SD, the SDG implementation. So it's important to look at all aspects uh, and having a holistic approach that focuses on people, the health, livelihoods and the ecosystems. And not to forget really is uh, the bringing on board the decision makers, the uh, high level political uh, high level political mid commitment and also having all levels involved to, to really move it forward and having uh, human and financial resources engaged. This slide uh, and Ronald mentioned this in the introduction. So while uh, the prevention is uh, really focused on different agendas, the disaster risk reduction and the peace building frameworks and institutions have gone uh, kind of uh, separately or in parallel and haven't come yet as as strongly together as uh, it should have could have maybe be done before. But now I think we had a good point where we are linking uh, those uh, topics and uh, with this discussion. 
we also look forward to hearing different concrete uh, examples, which we also found uh, by doing a literature review. So this we uh, selected uh, one of the study that was done by GFDR. This highlights really some of the disaster prone countries and highlighting some of the violence uh, and uh, uh, conflict uh, countries and here you can really see it's not uh, it's, there are some efforts undertaking also in disaster risk reduction so conflict affected uh, countries can be more vulnerable to disasters enduring more severe impacts from both natural and man-made shocks countries affected by protective humanitarian crisis and emergencies are among those most vulnerable to the impacts of disasters and the furthest behind in implementing the Sendai framework. These countries warrant particularly attention and support, yet evidence suggests that this support is not yet provided in a coherent and structured manner. Disaster risk reduction with this focus and on understanding risk and its emphasis on reducing exposure and vulnerability is critical for a solid humanitarian development and peace analysis and for effective programming and across climate disaster and humanitarian spheres. We have uh, found uh, in uh, different literature, there are different examples uh, looking at, uh, and we will hear some of those also today, uh, where we link actually disaster and peace. And uh, we have found in the official documentation, for example, the uh, special report, a secretary general report on the implementation of the Sender framework mentioning already in 2022, where it really looks at the interlinkages and, and disaster risk reduction as a tool also for sustaining peace at all levels. And we had in the terms of the midterm review for the Sender framework, which took uh, place the consultation in 2022 and finished last year with the political declaration. There it was also highlighted in uh, by different countries, but also in a study that looked at the nexus, the importance also for disaster risk reduction in the peace sphere. I just want to highlight this uh, that this is uh, there are some references already made, but more uh, would need to become, and it's also still a sensitive topic uh, in in some, uh, with some with some member states. We have found different entry points, uh, so some are very obvious, and maybe the last point is not as obvious, uh, and evidence is still still missing. But for example, it's uh, what I already mentioned in the slides before is that uh, fragile and conflict affected areas are particularly susceptible to disasters and crisis leading to higher human and environmental costs and also having really a higher uh, exposure and vulnerability. And the second point looks at um, the, the governance around this. So fragility and conflict can undermine government and non-governmental capacity to mitigate natural hazards. Conflict situation may limit disaster relief efforts or restrict access to vulnerable population. National governments structures may prioritize conflict or disaster risk management over disaster risk management. So that's also something that that may happen uh, in general in other contexts, not just a fragile context. And the last point, I think it's it's very important because uh, disaster can affect the light likelihood for peace. So while, as, as I mentioned already, evidence is still missing, but disasters can on the one hand exhibit social uh, political instability, but also it can create an opportunity for peace building. So that's something that I would uh, like to, that everybody to keep in mind for the session too. Uh, some entry points and opportunities uh, we found uh, are what I already mentioned is the multidimensional and comprehensive risk analysis. Uh, looking, for example, and we have uh, heard about uh, examples about the common country analysis and the cooperation framework context, where really all the different extra humanitarian peace and development uh, actors came together. Then the collective outcomes of joint planning for holistic informed uh, programming approaches. This also uh, looks uh, can be approached by all spheres and bringing actors together. And very importantly, uh, uh, financing instruments to support resilience building efforts and also promoting DR financing in this context. And I look very much forward to the discussions today. This was, as Soren said, just a scene setting and giving an introduction. Over to you, Ronald. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Sandra. And before we, we go to our discussions, let me just apologize. I, I don't think that Evo um, was able to, to join us uh, for today's discussion. Hopefully he'll be able to come in at some point, but just to note that we, we don't have Evo as one of our discussants. 
just quickly before I go to, to our discussions, um, Sandra, thanks for setting the scene, um, noting uh, most certainly the the issues around um, hazards. I think you've you've opened up the question around our collective understanding of how we define hazards and disasters. Um, you know, recognizing this this uh, intersection between natural and man-made hazards, and I think this is central to to this issue around there are and 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 conflict. Um, you point us to the importance of prevention being at the core. Um, I would say of risk reduction. Um, you know, here it doesn't matter if we're talking about natural hazards or man-made. It is it is really a, a common a common goal. Um, you've raised some key entry points. Um, one which is context, um, recognizing that in in fragile context, you you do have um, you know this interplay. Uh, between natural hazard events and development related variables and of course risk governance systems um, as, a, as a very important entry point to look at how we bring uh, these two um, frameworks or approaches together. Uh, the question around whether um, DRR impacts this whole issue or effort around building and sustaining peace is something you've put out to all of us around bringing the evidence to support this as a as a key entry point, and of course some approaches that that will allow us to be more effective. One being the multidimensional um, approach, comprehensive and joint analysis of of risk, and of course most importantly, and in, in certainly in contexts where we do have um, you know the natural and man made hazards such as conflict, the importance of joint planning, and uh, and a comprehensive approach to how we finance. The, the broader risk governance systems that are addressing um, these multiple issues and ensuring that they are appropriately delivered. So with that, allow me to to move to our, our discussions. And um, let me start with with the Sadio, I think it is, who is first on my, my list. So Sadio, for you, how how do the links between disaster risk and peace building play out in your everyday everyday work? Hello, thank you, thank you very much, thank you, colleagues. Uh, I would like to join Sandra and first of all to thank uh, the colleague from DPPA and UN DRR for organizing this event. As we know, for um, for many of the countries we cover or have covered the past. Uh, the link between uh, different types of disaster and tensions and conflicts is obvious. I think Sandra even mentioned uh, uh, the, uh, the linkages between uh, disasters and, and tensions and conflict around the world. Uh, many societies and population around the world are extremely uh, vulnerable, for example, to droughts, floods, earthquakes, tsunami, uh, disease, uh, heat waves, bushfires, and climate change, and uh, uh, its effects in, have considerably increased the vulnerability of population already facing uh, major structural, institutional, and political challenges. In the case of Mauritania, in the case of uh, uh, Chad, uh, where I was deployed in the past. So I would say that the conditions for peace uh, for peaceful coexistence and uh, stability are compromised by these uh, different types of, of disaster. So to respond to the question, I would say that um, DRR plays three roles to my understanding in peace building and, and, and sustainable peace, three roles. Uh, based on my experience in Mauritania, I'm here since uh, two months by the way, but I spent uh, one year and a half in Chad and uh, eight months in Guinea. Um, I would say that the first role to my understanding is that uh, it's play a preventive and risk management role that enable us to anticipate external shocks and act upstream and downstream on uh, potential drivers of conflict and tension. For example, in the eastern Mauritania, in the Hodel Sharpi, where we are facing a influx, massive influx of refugees, we are around um, 
181,000 refugees coming from, from Mali due to the conflict, uh, the outbreak violence in Northern Mali. Uh, in the Eastern Mauritania, we are working as a PDA, um, I'm supporting uh, different entities, UN entities. We are working on the issue of water scarcity and grassing and the conflict over grassing to reduce the risk of associated conflict around uh, uh, water and access to grassing. In this way, I would say that the disaster risk reduction dimension for me becomes a central dimension of the PDA's work because of the potential for conflict and destabilization associated with. So if you take, for example, the, the, uh, the Eastern Mauritania or the Southern Chad, uh, for example, the disruption of the, the transhumanist corridor uh, caused conflict between herders and farmers. And in the Mauritania here, the relationship between host community and, and refugees are very tense because of the scarcity of water and tension over uh, uh, the grassland. Well, I can even say that as a PDA, you cannot avoid taking into account DRR, particularly in the phase of understanding, uh, understanding the conflict, the, uh, the conflict dynamics, and after, of course, the phase of policy and strategy. So we have to understand very well the, the, the nature of the disaster. I think Sandra already mentioned that there is linkages, there's intersection, uh, one disaster can add to another one to lead to a conflict and tension. So I think for the PDA work, it is, it is, it is important to understand the nature of how these, uh, these interaction are, are playing and to have a broader understanding of the, the conflict dynamics in order for us to have strategies, to have planning, action plan to address uh, these challenges. So this leads me to talk about the second role which is for me a strategic role. So beside of the preventive and the management role, I think DDR, uh, DDR, <laughs> DRR, sorry, <laughs> has a strategic role. In conflict analysis and support for peace building and conflict prevention. I think um, where peaceful coexistence is weakened by climate change, for example, or disruption of a transhuman corridor, for example, the case in the southwest of Mauritania, which has been highlighted by a study conducted here last year by, by DPPA on climate, uh, peace, and security. In, south, in southwestern Mauritania, for example, we have a, a heat wave. And as a PDA, I provide technical support and advisory to different UN entities uh, where we are mobilizing a network of actors at different levels above so uh, establish a mechanism of coordination for the work of analysis and definition of areas of intervention to address the challenges that we encounter. So it is very important to have this coordination and I'm happy to see that also uh, Sandra has mentioned that the, 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 the a joint analysis is needed and having a, a holistic approach will be helpful to address those challenges related to, uh, to disasters. As well. In this sense, uh, to understand how disaster affects peace and social coexistence is very important to help develop a strategy with an action plan. So this is the part of the strategic role. I mean, the coordination between how, for example, to work in peace building, sustaining peace, is linked also to the uh, to DRR as a tool. So so each order to communicate. So I think for the for the PDA, depending where you are working, depending uh, uh, to which challenges you are facing, it is very important based on the understanding of the nature of the conflict and the dynamics of the conflict to see how we can use uh, the DRR tools in order to to have this joint analysis, this strategic comprehension to help the RCs or the the good offices of the the authorities in the region to address. Uh, 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 tension and conflict. Finally, this should be the third role. Uh, I think to create the condition for the resilience of social systems, disaster risk management must be, to my understanding, sensitive to social norms and practices. To be sensitive to social norms and practices, uh, 
There are cases where, for example, I, I saw it when I was in Germany and Chad, there are cases where governance structures depend on what uh, I would like to call a uh, disaster economy. In French, we call that uh, les économies du désastre. That means you have a context of fragility where people in a position of power use the position to profit from these disasters they instrumentalize the disaster to make uh, more money and even to reinforce the position of power. So for the effort in terms of peace building and sustaining peace, I think for me, it is very important to understand these social norms and practices and to get, uh, and to get involved the local authorities in a transformative way. Uh, because if we don't understand these how norms and, practice, and social practice are, are playing how they perceive uh, this disaster and how in the level of governance they are trying to organize themselves to face uh, with, it will be very difficult to us to strategize and to get involved all the entities. So I'll finally, I will add that around disaster, this is the optimistic things that I would like to share, around disaster, uh, we could create the condition for peaceful coexistence and social cohesion. I think for me, DRR could be kind of incubator of peace and social cohesion because disaster affects the entire community, as I see in the Mauritania and Chad, and disaster affects their livelihood, their, their existence. So through a common commitment, you know, a common commitment to face the disaster and include everyone in the definition of the solution in the phase of thinking about the, 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 the dynamic of the conflict based on the understanding of the disaster, we can create, I mean, when I say we, it is different experts, when we combine our expertise, when we combine our analysis, we can create proximity and awareness of a common, on a common destiny. Because as I said previously, this, uh, uh, this disaster are affecting all the community. So I will stop there for, so these three, uh, three roles that the RR play in, in, in terms of supporting peace building and standing peace. But I'll come back, of course, if there are questions. Thanks. Over. Thank, you ver thank you very much, um, Amadou. Uh, quite a bit um, you've raised there and certainly going today to, I, I think, the third entry point um, of, of Sandra's um, scene setting around, you know, starting to provide the evidence um for 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 DRR um for disasters and how it, it impacts peace and it, it 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 came out I would say in your third in the third of your three um points there where you 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 reference um you know what sometimes is often referred to as the politics of disasters you know in 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 my pre previous role where you you know you you spoke of the the third one being creating the condition for resilience understanding the norms and, and culture, et cetera. Um, and you referred to it as the disaster economy where people in positions of power um, have tended to profit, to use and to leverage this, this position to profit from adverse events, to maintain um, and sustain you know, those, those spaces of power. Um, your, your, the, the other of your two um, points refer to the strategic role that DRR can play um, in really bringing this sort of joint analysis and strategic positioning. And the first you reference was that of uh, the prevention and risk management role, um, looking at the whole approach to anticipating shocks. Um, and I think more importantly, because I think oftentimes we forget this piece, but it's not so much about the event, but more looking at the root cause and drivers. And I think your your point really brought that home to us about the you know the, the fact that issues around scarcity, um, particularly of natural resources, are themselves part of what makes people vulnerable, insecure, but also drive some of the um, the, the 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 outcome, the adverse outcomes, including conflict. Right. And you mentioned water scarcity. And access to grasslands. So thanks, thanks for those very, very important reflections. I, I now want to turn uh, my attention to 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 Paul. Um, your country context, Haiti, is fragile and volatile, with humanitarian needs rising. Moving from humanitarian response to resilience building would require 
national and local ownership. How, how do you view this need for national ownership playing out in fragile and conflict affected countries? And where does the peace building element come in? And I, you know, I think all of us are no strangers to the news. You know, Haiti, unfortunately, is one of those places where you do see um, this interplay of, of sort of natural hazards and man-made hazards, violence, conflict, et cetera, and, and this whole question around you know, embedding ownership to be resilient. So looking forward to hearing your reflections. Um, Paul, over to you. Um, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. It's very nice to be here with you today and uh, be able to uh, participate on this panel uh, on peace. And thank you, Ronald, for this very interesting question. A sub question for Haiti, however, would be, how can we achieve this national and local ownership um, in the current political context where every democratic institution from the justice system to parliament is no longer functioning. So in 2022, it became evident to many observers that climate and environmental hazards, disasters and challenges were among the drivers of the current insecurity situation in Haiti. So was created the Climate Security Group. The Climate Security Group is in itself a successful peace building initi initiative because uh, it regroups between 60 to 90 organizations from uh, Haitian government organizations, um, uh, international uh, and financial organizations, international governmental fin uh, organizations, international financial organizations, many uh, international NGOs and more than 60 um, civil society organizations or grassroots organizations. All of these uh, organizations did not and still do not have the same perspective or agree on the same uh, political or economic agenda for Haiti. But they do all have a common agenda, which is the environment, climate and peace agenda. One of the objectives of the Climate Security Group was to command an introductory study on climate security in Haiti to map out the linkages between climate peace and security and propose initial steps on how to resolve them. The report uh, was realized by the international think tank Adelphi and published in 2023 and was endorsed by all the members of the Climate Security Group. One of the conclusions of the report is that natural disasters and uh, climate change push people into harmful practices and exacerbate competition over natural resources resulting in further conflict and insecurity. And one of these adaptation practices is migration and displacement, which particularly affects young people and most particularly affects young women. Migration towards urban areas has been a dominant coping strategy for a long time, but since 2021, a reverse pattern has also emerged and people have started fleeing urban areas to return to rural areas. So, and migration between subsistence systems has also intensified due to the effects of natural disasters and climate change. These mobility patterns directly affect the resilience of the communities and uh, exacerbate conflict over natural resources. As we speak, gangs control the capital, Paris, as well as key roads and other infrastructure across the country, using violent tactics, um, including rape and gender-based gender violence against the population to assert their authority. I found very interesting what Sajo said about instrumentalizing disasters because this is exactly what is happening right now in Haiti. Uh, there are more than 362,000 people now displaced in Haiti because of gang violence. More than half of them are children. So the, the study concludes that without a new approach, uh, with an explicit focus on climate and peace building, Haiti is doomed to spiral into further chaos. The study recommends building a high level national vision through multi-sectoral dialogue uh, that places climate security as well as the protection and restoration of the environment at the center of all economic, political and social uh, decision making. So before the collapse of the de facto government and its replacement with the actual 
or I would I would say now potential uh, transitional council. Um, me, uh, we, meaning the Ministry of Environment and the members of the Climate Security Group, uh, were advocating for this multi-sectoral dialogue with the objective of um, formulating a national policy on uh, climate security to complement uh, other existing policies such as the National Adaptation Plan. Now, while the climate security group uh, in all of its diversity cannot replace a democratic democratically elected government, of course, it can act as a technical and multidimensional space for dialogue and national ownership uh, to support the formulation of a national climate and security strategy. Regarding um, local ownership, the results of the UN Peacebuilding Fund thematic review that was published in 2023 suggest that bottom-up peacebuilding around uh, local natural resources uh, issues may be among the most promising uh, areas for peacebuilding in difficult and conflictual environments such as Haiti. So we are supporting community-based responses to environmental management and sustainability that have nature-based solutions at their core as an entry point to address broader dynamics of uh, insecurity and violence. Uh, considering that um, migration and displacement, uh, displacement is such a huge issue right now in Haiti, not only nationally, but I, I should say regionally as well. We have different go uh, initiatives going on uh, with local communities um, regarding the um, uh, reintegration of migrants. One worth mentioning is the funded by the UN Peacebuilding Fund to reduce conflict uh, and security and, and migration among young people, facilitate the reintegration of young migrants and reinforce uh, social cohesion and resilience in the communities through agroecology and uh, community environmental peace building. I, I need to mention also this very um, huge and very important project piloted by UNDP called the Three Rivers Watershed uh, financed by the Green Climate Fund. This uh, project, I think it's 28 million, is recognized as groundbreaking for its inclusion of conflict sensitivity, which includes conflict sensitive uh, um, and peace building approach to water management. These initiatives that are going on um, will inform and will inform the climate security group. So they are discussed with the members of the group and eventually uh, we hope um, this will help help to replicate uh, these initiatives in other, uh, in the other communities. So I, I am running out of time, so I will stop here and um, we'll be welcoming any questions later. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Paul. I think you've, you've really raised some, some key issues there that I'm sure the attendees you know, will maybe uh, come back on, maybe even your colleagues. Um, but I think you've started out with a very important question to the question, right? In in a in a context such as 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 Haiti, um, where you have the sort of breakdown in institutional systems of governance at the national level, how how do you really achieve this sort of um, national ownership um, in such a context? Which is certainly a, a very important question for us to to consider. Um, and to look at as we move forward in our in our next evolution of support uh, in contexts such as these, um, you know, you really spoke to where where you see, you know, all interests, um, I say converging, where there may be differences, where where the interests are converging certainly is on this issue of environment, and if you link that back to to Amadou's comments around, you know, the key drivers. We do see, um, you know, this as being a very important entry point for addressing some of these common drivers that cuts across the conflict and 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 sort of natural hazard type um, related related events. You've painted a picture, certainly, of a vicious cycle. Um, you know, when when you speak to contexts such as Haiti, where you know you've you've pointed to natural hazard events potentially driving some of these tensions um, around. Mm -hmm the uh, or an exact tensions around natural resources that are exacerbating uh con conflicts or, or or you know existing conflict situations so there we are seeing a vicious cycle how do we break that um and you've spoken to some uh potential initiatives that may plant a seed 
of how we can apply tools like conflict sensitivity in some of the projects that are looking to address some of the, um, you know, the, the sort of root cause and drivers. All in all, I think you've raised a question which we can come back to later um, when we get into further discussion around the issue. Is the issue climate or is it an issue around equity, justice, access, opportunities and governance? Right. I mean, you know, we tend to get drawn to the event centric issues, but really looking at some of these other other things, which I think, again, cuts across your point and Amadou's point. Let me move quickly then to Andrea. Um, your, your question, Andrea, you have experience working in both humanitarian and development settings um, and are now working on climate, peace and security in Iraq. In your opinion, is there enough collaboration on disaster risk reduction, humanitarian response, conflict prevention, peace and peace building across different communities? If no, why not and what needs to change i mean I've, I've dropped the why not in there right because i think we have to understand why it's not happening and what in your opinion and your experience what do we need to change to to, to really to really resolve this issue if that is the case over to you okay <laughs> thank you um, the why that was the hard question so i'll come back to that one um i would say to start on a positive note we're getting better you know progress has been made on breaking down the barriers between these different sectors and i guess from my own experience in particular you know the divide between the kind of environment climate peace and security humanitarian and development side it used to be quite broad um and Certainly, when I first started at UNHCR, the, even the idea that that should be something that an, a humanitarian agency works on was relatively new. But I think we've come past that in a big way. And so I think there's been a lot of effort and will to sort of bridge these divides. And there's a huge recognition now that you know, there are these nexuses between peace, development, um, and environment and that if we don't address them the humanitarian burden increases and we're not providing good humanitarian assistance so i think from that respect um, things have improved but it is not nearly as consistent or as widespread as you know we really need it to be to provide good services but i think the fact that there has been improvement shows the depth um and very good work that's been done on the advocacy um, and political side to really break down some of the conceptual barriers around this. Um, I think it was mentioned um, by Sandra earlier that there's still a little bit of resistance sometimes, particularly when it comes to talking about peace and security um, and disaster risk or environmental factors. It's something that still you know, requires some effort on the political and advocacy side, but it's increasingly becoming recognized and accepted so on that conceptual and policy side i think a lot has been done um, and it, that needs to be recognized and so now we can talk about how for example if we do good drr that is community-based that includes all the stakeholders that need to be included how that can actually underpin and promote peace and that, that then in turn underpins and promotes good development opportunity and it gives people choices that they can make because they're not being forced into you know, poor coping mechanisms because they don't have any choices. So I also think if we put our shoes or our feet into the shoes of the people that we're trying to serve on the ground, they wouldn't necessarily see it that way. They would still see quite a lot of gaps and inconsistencies um, and incoherence in the way that we are delivering services to them um, and so I think that's to be expected because building will and wanting to work together is one thing but actually operationalizing that and finding ways to do that practically is a whole different ballgame um, and it bumps up against a number of institutional and just structural and practical barriers that we need to overcome and um, in a small ways, I think we're breaking down these barriers. And again, it was noted earlier that assessments are a really good entry point, especially when we all get together and we do need assessments or development planning. 
there is an opportunity for the DRR approach to actually become harmonizing because it does have this element of looking widely at multiple hazards, multiple vulnerabilities, and also multiple capacities. So I think using that as the lens for which we do our joint planning and assessments is a really good way to start to bridge that divide in a concrete thing that we're all doing or should be doing anyway. Um, and in Iraq, we've started doing that in a way with the common country analysis this year. So that included not only all of the agencies, but also UNAMI um, and support from actors that could bring in that peace building and that disaster risk detection lens. And I think the CCA is a lot stronger for it. Um, and now it's informing the new country cooperation framework. So it will bring that same flavor in it of understanding, particularly in Iraq climate risks at the moment, because they're so strongly associated with our disaster risks um, and having that as theme coming through for the development planning, but also for creating development planning that has that peace positive, conflict sensitive lens applied to it through that disaster risk reduction approach. So I think that's actually playing out in quite a practical way here in Iraq. Where it tends to fall down a little bit is when I try to translate that into actual on the ground programming and that service delivery that I talked to you about before, because that's when we're all under quite different pressures. So all of our agencies move at different time scales. All of our agencies have their own mandates and their specific goals and targets that they need to deliver. And so bridging that with holistic interventions can be quite tricky. And I think in particular, because one of the pressures that we're all under is to keep things neat and tidy, to have crisp narratives with very clear project targets, outcomes that have quite linear connections. And we're under pressure to keep things simple and clear when what we need is to build a system that embraces complexity. Um, and starts to say, OK, we need to address multiple things through our programming. And we need to get away from the clear two pager and start digging into complex issues and interlinkages and ways in which we can address these clusters of Gordian knots of problems. Um, and I think that requires advocacy on all of our parts with our own agencies. Um, and also with donors in particular to be open to these more challenging complex issues and therefore more complex and more challenging to deliver projects that have to be by nature delivered in consortia and across with agencies. So I think that's one thing that will really push this forward. Pushing for an embracement of complexity um, over the two pager and the very clear crisp narratives. Um, and I think part of that is starting to come. Joint programming is being incentivized. Um, many more agencies are coming together to create more holistic programs, bringing in the different capacities of different agencies. Things like the Green Climate Fund that was noted earlier, you know, it's really looking at you know, bigger, longer term programming that's going to be able to address a number of issues and is also itself under pressure to include things like peace positive programming. So I think that's one of the things that can help and I think we need to keep advocating for that. Um, and then I also think we need to be looking at longer term time scales and this is particularly challenging for our humanitarian friends um, where the time scales are so quick and you have to be really nimble. But if from the outside we can start to look, you know, past crisis point through a 5, 10, 15 year arc towards recovery and resilience, that's when we start to really look at the best needs for, again, the communities that we're going to serve. And that's not easy um, because that usually is well beyond any of our planning cycles. But I think we can start to embed it and advocate for it in the way that we think about programming as not just something that's going to happen for the two or three year term, but something that should lead on to longer term development goals, longer term resilience building. And I do think the DRR approach, and especially where it's embedded into community approaches, is you know a great starting point for that.
Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. I, I think your call suggests you're you 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 finished ah quite quite interesting. I was I mean I I spent a lot of time jotting notes, um, so I didn't even realize that you had actually stopped you know stopped your delivery because I, I quite a bit was coming out. I think um, that warrants maybe maybe further engagements as we get into the discussion sessions. I mean you know you you talked about seeing improvements. Um, even if not widespread, but certainly the, you know, the the strands upon which we can we can start to knit the fabric of a of a more positive future is is beginning to emerge. Um, uh, uh, you know, you, you've you've talked about the community, you know, providing greater effort um, that is is bridging this particular divide. Um, reference to good work in in the areas of advocacy. Um, particularly in breaking down some of the conceptual barriers, which I think are are certainly inhibitors to the, the sort of transformation we want to see. And this is leading, as you've outlined, to great acceptance emerging across the wider community um, that, that you've listed. Um, you, you pointed to the fact that good DRR um, at the community level can, can you know, lead to or underpin peace. And, and thereby provide um, good development, which I think is a very important point. And I think one of the things we should not um, take lightly is your point about, I mean, you didn't word it exactly like this, but I, I saw it as, you know, paying attention to the, the reflections you gave from the field, right? The lens of the beneficiaries as being very important um, as it helps us to center our attention on the shared objectives that we should have. Um, you know, do these beneficiaries, do these local communities see integration and efficiency, or do they see fragmentation? I think that's something that you you really raise. And if we if we don't pay attention to that and use that as our temperature check as we go forward, then we you know we will go off 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 target. Uh, the question of how do we translate all of this work that's happening, sort of at the strategic and, and advocacy lens into programming on the ground. Um, given the sort of mandates, targets, and timeframes, I would say battle rhythm across the different agencies who are who are working in that space or something you flagged up as something we need to uh, to get get over. But I think this is very much landing in your point about the need to embrace complexity and complex issues. It may be linked to you know the emergence in the UN system around the systems approach and and really getting to to um to to this issue of unknotting the Gordian knots, <laughs> right? I wonder if whether we're we're too bounded by log frames because here you also spoke to the importance of thinking. If we're talking about resilience, it's really long longer term. So you're raising some questions here around the, the sort of financing arrangements that drive many of our programs, which are which which ties us very much to to these log frames and, and doesn't necessarily foster, you know, the, the sort of experimentation that, um, you know, that gives us the, the, the sort of outcomes and the peace positive programs that we, we want to see. But definitely the point around incentivizing joint programming, I think came out strongly in your, in your offer. Let me turn now to Cecilia. Um, uh, you have ample experience of working on bringing together environmental, disaster risk, and climate elements at both local and global level. How has the conversation and action evolved in the past 10 years? And what needs to happen next? I mean, you know, you have certainly a very long time span on looking at these issues. <laughs> I'm sure you've gathered some experience over the time that you may, you know, you may want to share with us. Over to you, Celia. Yeah, thanks. Thanks so much, Ron. I, I think I'm I am indeed coming in as a bit of the old timer here <laughs> um, and uh, and the question sort of asks for a, a historical perspective. So let me try and take a, a step back maybe from the situation today, which has been really brilliantly um, presented by the, the speakers so far. And I'll certainly echo, probably repeat uh, a lot of the points, but maybe that can provide as well a bit of a, a summary to, to some of the takeaway messages from other speakers. So. 
Um, yeah, I mean, to answer your, your, your question more directly, I mean, I, I think the conversation, the situation has evolved a great deal. I think most of the speakers have, have said it, and it's obviously clear in, in today's discussion and, and the very fact that there's a conversation on this um, as a peace dialogue. Um, but maybe, you know, since I work for the UN Environment Programme, that provides a little bit of a, a unique vantage point, because I think in many ways the environment and more specifically the climate, as we've been hearing today, has really been the bridge uh, and certainly one of the key drivers for the integration that we see between uh, disaster risk reduction and, and peace building. Um, the separation that was mentioned by uh, Sandra earlier on between like these different communities of practice is certainly reflected or even mirrored in my own <laughs> you know, professional experience. I've been working for UNEP and for, more specifically for something called the Disasters and Conflicts Branch for 15 years. And for the better part of those 15 years, despite its name, which would imply some form of integration, we basically worked as two, you know, very separate teams, um, often doing quite the same things, you know, trying to sort of focus on the environmental dimensions of crisis, but with with an entirely different frameworks, constituencies, mechanisms, and basically speaking a, a different language. Um, on the conflict and environment side, which is where, where I sit on the conflict side, we were early on sort of focusing on either the impacts of conflict on the environment. So, you know, what happens to the environment in a bombing campaign and how does that affect human health and, you know, prospects for recovery or on how the exploitation of the environment, you know, was helping to finance conflict. So think, you know, blood diamonds and uh, timber wars, etc. But there was very little anchor for a DRR perspective in our work on peace and security. Um, really, the only example I was trying to think back, and the only example I could think of was sort of the "build back better" mantra uh, in post-conflict recovery, which obviously had some some DRR um, implications. Um, and similarly, my colleagues working on DRR most often in fragile states, um, we're, working on, <laughs> we're working on these issues without ever engaging with uh, peace building actors or peace and security actors more, more broadly. And this all really changed with the uh, emergence of climate change as a security issue. Somehow the you know, climate change kind of broke through the peace and security space in a way that environmental, other environmental dimensions had not. Um, we all know that has as much to do with the acceleration of the climate crisis as it has to do with political fears around climate related migration um, and uh, but you know for for better or worse that has created a, a very significant opening from for for disaster risk or the, the integration of disaster risk in uh, peace and security um, you know agendas and programming uh, I mean first from an analytical perspective as we've heard many times uh, you know, better understanding uh, climate and, and related disaster risks, their linkages to conflict and instability, uh, which have fed into effort, efforts of, you know, prediction and early warning and, uh, you know, uh, fed into assessments and joint planning exercises, uh, and now increasingly as a, as a programming issue around uh, building resilience to the root causes of conflict and instability, which of course include climate change and associated disasters. So it's interesting, this language of resilience, which is really born out of the DRR community, has become this kind of federating concept um, now, which is, you know, permeating the peace and security space uh, from my perspective as well. So, I mean, there's a lot of focus on integrated approaches and Andrea has said that there are many, many challenges for this, that's true. Um, but at the same time, I think we are slowly but surely building a really solid evidence base around uh, integrated approaches. From my perspective, that's sort of integrating climate adaptation with peace building approaches, but my colleagues on the DRR side, if I can still call it that, call it eco DRR, and we're basically doing very similar, very, very similar things. Um, you know, using integrated water resource management for flood protection, uh, forest restoration for drought prevention. I mean, these kinds of things and implementing these um, uh, actions in, in ways that build social cohesion and, you know, trust with local government and inclusion, etc. So, yep, it's challenging, of course, uh, and there have been, you know, mistakes and uh, lessons learned along the way. But I think we now, you know, have a pretty solid understanding of how this work can be done at least at local level, um, I think where some of the gaps still are, are, you know, how do you implement these types of approaches in, you know, complex regional contexts with transboundary resources that are themselves at the, you know, at the heart of conflict. And I think Andrea certainly sits in one of those regions where um, uh, that, you know, we still have a lot to learn um, on that. 
Um, so yeah, integration is happening. Uh, the fact that my DRR colleagues are running after me for inputs to the UN plan of action <laughs> and reporting on the Sendai framework, I guess is is one side of that. But uh, I mean, all joking aside, we're, we're working much closely, much more closely together. But are we there? I mean, of course not. I think in addition to all of the things that have been said by by previous speakers and 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 to Andrea's points as well about the need to better coordinate um, our agendas. I think the fact is that a lot of the evidence base that we that has emerged that we have developed over time has been largely financed through peace building funds. Um, PBF, the, the peace building fund, has played a, a very significant role and taken a lot of risks in, um, in investing in some of these early experiences. Uh, disaster risk reduction funds have have funded some of this, you know, some of the smaller environmental funds as well. But we all know that's not where the money has to come from to scale these approaches uh, to the scale and they need to they need to be. And this is re really where we need to be tapping um, into much larger finance financing sources, including climate climate financing. And there's you know, we all know that there's a big awakening happening within the climate space. Um, I mean, the, the, the COP28 declaration on what was it, climate relief, recovery and peace, I think, um, you know, is is one of the steps in the right direction, calling for uh, an increase in climate adaptation and resilience building in fragile and conflict uh, affected contexts. Um, and that's due to a lot of really good advocacy to overcome some serious resistance within the climate community, but there's still a lot of barriers to integrate, integration in terms of how financing is allocated. Um, and quite frankly, still a lot of risk aversion um, towards in large investments in uh, conflict affected and, and fragile contexts. I mean, you know, I, I, I think we all have we all have examples and without without wanting to, to name names. Um, if you look at the, you know, kind of allocation of the GCF portfolio or the GEF portfolio, um, you know, conflict affected uh, and fragile contexts are still very or, or much lower on the list uh, than medium income countries. Um, and that in and of itself is uh, an issue. So I'll just I mean, I think there, there there's a lot to be said, but the just to end on on perhaps a, a positive note, um, I do think that the loss and damage agenda uh, presents really significant uh, opportunities to bring these issues much more closely uh, together, it's an emerging <laughs> agenda now, which allows us to all, you know, act to sort of advocate for that integration under under that broader agenda. I understand I'm, I'm not a loss and da damage specialist by any uh, stretch, but I understand that um, that uh, in the sort of early discussions, uh, there's a significant focus on human mobility, uh, which is obviously a, a joint issue. <laughs> Uh, that that also brings uh, DRR closer to to peace building. So we're there there there's a lot to be um, you know there's a lot to be hopeful about that we we can sort of overcome some of these uh, barriers and 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 increase uh, financing for scaling integrated approaches. So I'll stop here and glad to come back to a lot of this uh, through the question and answer session. Thanks, Ron. No no thank you, Celia. I think um, it's wonderful to listen to. I mean um, certainly as and maybe a, maybe a dinosaur in the practice space. Uh, a lot of what you <laughs> what you've mentioned resonate with me. I was listening to your comment about you could be our, our and yeah, I've I've seen it all evolve. It's, it's you know as I said before, you know um, old wine being being put in new skins, and 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 that may be sort of the bane of some of the problems we're we're grappling with. And and I'll and I'll come back to that. But um, certainly very interesting reflections there. Um, I think most importantly, the, the top line is that the conversation really has evolved uh, and you've been able to over your 10 years, maybe attest to that um, somewhat. Um, I found this, this question around separation between communities of practice, an interesting one. Um, you know, I, I myself have often reflected, you know, um, based on my own background, which is really fundamentally looking at the issue of, of planning, um, where you talk about social economic and then I've been put in a box because of the the role I play in a particular institution organization as belonging to a particular community and not to another, which I found um, quite strange. But I think this is this is certainly um, at, the, at the heart of this. Um, but but that there is an effort to bring the themes together, um, though structurally, um, you know, we've we've managed to give them the name 
uh, institutionally, but operationally, we you know we still see this um this silo um, and siloed approach, and it it really caused me to reflect a little bit around where are we failing? Is it is it is it the issue of silos? I mean, if we think about an orchestra, we have different groups of instruments, right? And it really is about the conductor and how well the conductor gets the the different instruments to really play. Uh, play well um, and to come up with a symphony and maybe that's maybe that's something we need to be looking at is it is it is it a silo that is the issue or are we missing that that expert conductor <laughs> that gets us to all you know harmonize um the reference to climate change creating an opening for integration of disaster risk reduction in peace and security programs um interesting perspective um you know one one wonders whether or not this is um a problem of the international development cooperation system and, and the UN, or is it is it you know is this what we see if we look from the ground up? You know, are the sort of national governments processes and systems reflective of that, or is this very much uh, driven by the sort of global policy space um, that is then uh, manifesting itself in in these 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 challenges? Rebranding, renaming of themes. Um, you know, noting that we've made mistakes, but importantly, we're learning. Um, you know, we're we're going back on 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 some of the lessons and trying to see how well we can we can resolve these issues. Uh, I think ultimately, what I've heard coming out both from you and many of the colleagues who spoke before you um, is this need for us to get back to a focus on on root cause. And drivers, I think these are fundamentally uh, central to where we need to situate. Um, I, you know, I, I'm hearing as I listen to all of you, maybe not explicitly coming out, but are grappling with the with themes. Um, and even you know, Celia, you gave a a, a a personal reflection, and it's certainly part of our journey within within our organization around. Are are we, you know, by for forcing ourselves into themes and not so much our own disciplines. Um, you know, is, is this part of why we're struggling to really get this kind of integration and fundamental focus on root cause drivers and applications of tools like conflict sensitivity and the broader um, approaches around risk analysis that is really focusing on what we define risk as right? Um, vulnerability, exposure, which cuts across whether you're talking about climate issues, um, conflict issues, or, you know, some of the, the other natural hazard issues. A good question for us to ponder. Um, funding. I mean, again, many of this is potentially driven by the, the global financing architecture, right? We talk about climate finance and development finance and humanitarian finance and this environment finance. And yet we lose track of the fact that this is really about development. It's a, it's all development financing, but we've created this global architecture that forces us to silo these resources. And then, you know, we're grappling with trying to bring them together. And as Andrea said, you know, they, this whole issue of efficiency and effectiveness of how we, we apply these resources. I think that's all coming through um, in the comments. So loss and damage agenda, um, is it a solution? Or another source of fragmentation, um, something we need to think about, um, and it comes out very much in terms of, again, showing our our age in the practice. You know, we're, we've we've gone away from talking about, um, you know, push and pull migration, one which is, you know, ultimately negative, um, and some which are positive, right? To to use of the term human mobility, and we've captured that all in terms of our our, our approaches to these challenges. Some fantastic questions coming up around how we are leveraging this DR um, process as a, a as a, a proposition for, for for grappling with some of these conflict related issues. I see it also on the other side. How are we leveraging conflict tools in ensuring that our approaches to managing risks are themselves not creating further problems down the road? All interesting. Let's open up. Let's open up the. I mean, we don't have Evo. I, I gather. Um, I haven't seen Evo. Actually, pop up. sorry to jump in, but he was able to join now, so we do okay. have Evo okay. uh, here great, as well. Great, great, Evo. Please come on screen. I almost, 
almost danced past you and tried to use up your five minutes given that you were you were missing. <laughs> so let's let's invite the evil because I think it's important that we we get views from you know from from folks who are working uh, at the local and community levels. So Evo, um, if you are there, my question for you is welcome, welcome Evo. We we often and I hope your connection is stable enough that you can hear us. We often hear that local communities are less interested in global definitions and frameworks and of which type of funding is used for a specific intervention and more interested in concrete support on the ground. Do you agree with this? And what is your message to the global community? I think that's very important. What is your message to the global community of what needs to happen to really deliver this resilience we, we talk about, whether we're coming to it from natural hazards, climate, conflict, um, both to disasters, conflicts um, at, at a local level. Uh, your, your voice is very important in this discussion. So let's hear from you, Evo. Over to you and welcome. You're, you're mute, Evo, please, please unmute. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. I apologize for coming late because of my, the poor internet in my place, the poor connection. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, I'll start by saying people like youth here in my place, they are less privileged in terms of uh, activities, many activities because of drug introduction. They have introduced drugs. These are harsh drugs, marijuana and um, uh, to, uh, tobacco and um, uh, we call uh, 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 tramo. Um, then uh, in this state, you see uh, women and gay, uh, women and child abuse, less, uh, less privilege in education, less privilege in agriculture. They don't like to work. They don't like to do many things. So here in our place, we are suffering from it's real. Colleagues, uh, please, please try to remain mute while our, our, our panelists are giving their contribution. Thanks. Ivo, I know you're grappling with internet challenges there. We'll, we'll wait a little bit to hear from you because I think your voice is, is quite important in this debate. Maybe you, maybe you want to close the video, Evo, and just go with the, with the voice that might give you some better bandwidth. I think we, oh, there he, he's still there. So Evo, yes, um, go ahead. Let, let's see if we can hear you without the video. That might be better in terms of keeping your connection a little bit stable. Okay, uh, thank you for the understanding. Um, Wonderful. Wonderful. We can hear so you without a fear. <laughs> What happened here is a uh, crisis, first of all, here in the northwest and the southwest of Cameroon. First of all, this. Uh... This is uh, a crisis. People have relocated because of the crisis. Uh, people have relocated because of the crisis here in our place. Um, women and gay child abuse here in our place. Um, youths have been abused, drug taking, and so many other things. If I can just name just a few here in our place. Then we go into uh, 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 climate change. You see deforestation. Deforestation here 
is too much. People are cutting down trees because they don't know the importance of tree. So what we are doing here, we are just trying like to replant. We replant, we create tree nurseries. If you can look where I am sitting now, we are trying to like see to replant trees here to, to, to restore a forest here. Because there was a forest here because of grazer men, they burned down everything. So we are trying to like restore the forest here. Can you hear me? Hearing you, Ivo. I'm, I'm hearing you. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Thank you. The awareness of the education, education, the education here is not the best. Community engagement in agriculture is not the best. Infrastructure development is not the best. Natural resources management is not the best. Conflict, conflict resolutions here. These are some of the, the things, these are some of the things that we need to, they need to address here in my local community where I am. Thank you. So, so question for you, Kivo. Uh, amidst all these things you're trying to, to address in your community, does, the, does this whole fragmenting of financing or branding of financing really help you if you're trying to access resources to deliver on on things like if your your forest be planting yes financial uh, that's uh, financial uh, financial problems also some of these things to carry them on we need finances to like uh, like the, to create a, 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 a to create a nursery for trees to be nursed we need finance to like have good education here, we need finance to like create awareness for the youth to know the importance of climate, uh, to teach them what is climate change or to like bring them back from drug taking. We need finances to create jobs that can employ them to do many things. And and one last one last question to you, Eva, before we we open the floor to 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 the delegates and and maybe even our panelists who may want to weigh in on some of the issues shared. From where you sit, does the community care about these global policy frameworks? You know, these global frameworks on disaster risk reduction, conflict climate change how how is the problem viewed on the ground is it viewed in in terms of these global frameworks or do you view it as simply these issues you are speaking to the importance of dealing with the the um less less or underprivileged youths in your community i hope you heard me Give Evo a few seconds. I think he is really grappling with the internet connections. Um, he's also muted, it seems. Ah, yes. Yes, he seems he's muted. All right. What I'm saying is that yeah. some of the people, some of the people in my community, they care and they want people to educate them. But most of them, they don't care. They don't care. They don't care about uh, the, 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 uh, the development of the place. They just do what they want to do because they, they are not educated. Yeah. yeah. No, I think, I think we read you loud and clear, Ivo. And um, let me thank you because I know it must be frustrating to have to, to try to contribute to the dialogue with the, with the internet challenges you're facing. Um, but but I think we were able to capture the essence of your points there because I think it is also central to the conversation we've been having around how do we where where is our entry point on you know resolving this this nexus between uh, disaster risk reduction and conflict you know many of the things we were able to raise and discuss amongst the panelists around importance of looking at root cause and drivers certainly in your delivery you you really spoke to 
some of the key issues, the fundamental issues upon which all of these calamities um, that we are having to, to, to grapple with are, are based, which is inequalities, access, rights, um, and so forth and so on, education, right? These are all fundamentally at the heart of, of the challenges that cut across whichever one of the sort of hazard landscapes you come at this from, whether it is from a natural hazard, a man-made hazard, or whether you're looking at the issues of, of how climate change is amplifying this, this hazard and space. So really wonderful to, to hear from you. Colleagues, we have we have certainly another, is it uh, seven, seven minutes? Um, you, can, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we had to grapple with a little bit of a slightly late start and, um, and some internet issues, but we want to open the floor to the participants if you have any questions. Um, the, the chat has not been so active, but certainly if, if we see maybe a show of hands, we'll take maybe one or two key questions. I also want to invite the panelists. I mean, if you've heard um, from your colleagues, certainly important points raised, um, issues surfacing, you know, please let's let's make this a, a, a dynamic last seven minutes. I, I see one hand from Carol Monica Rosumek. Carol, please. Um, let me let Hi. Me Hello, nice to meet please. you. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Um, I work for the Peace Building Support Office in the partnership team, the partnership team with uh, IFIs. And I was wondering uh, when it comes to the panelists, uh, if they had to engage with development banks uh, on those issues, because they are they can be pretty active in everything that is development, uh, development of community, the climate issues, obviously, uh, are of bigger concerns for the Asian Development Bank, for example. So I was wondering if you've had to uh, interact with them in, in on those issues and what were their role and how did you engage with them, if so? Thank you, Carol. Um, while we wait to see if there's any other questions, any one of the panelists wants to tackle that issue in your path of travel? Have you interacted with the development banks on this issue? Uh, go ahead, Amadou. And then I also saw another hand. Yes, thank you, Ron. Yeah, uh, yeah I'd like to, to say that, yes, um, as part of my work is to try to connect with, uh, for example, uh, the African Development Bank. They have a um, kind of uh, transition, transition branch uh, in the office. Um, beside of the African Development Bank, I work closely with the, the World Bank too because they have the, the SCV, the Fragility, Conflict and Violence. They have they have having the window, the, the, um, the prevention and discussion window, the, the PRA that they have in the World Bank. So when I was in Chad, I, I as a PDA, I tried to set up kind of uh, commit, let's say committee in, at the working level between the RCO, uh, the RCO PDA, the, the, the responsible in the World Bank of the SCV and the African Development Bank. So we try together it in Eastern Chad specifically when we are facing, when we were facing the, the spilling over the Sudanese conflict in Chad. So we try to, to have kind of, to gather a lot of information and to cross track our analysis and the information that we, we had from the field in order to try to develop kind of not common vision, but kind of common comprehension of the of the, the link between uh, climate change, for example, on some disaster and 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 uh, and uh, the peace building issue. So yes, we so even here in Mauritania, uh, we are we are working closely with with the IFIs in terms of having a, a joint comprehension on those on those challenges. And the in the regard of of, um, of the concept of resilience too, we sometimes we try to have a comprehension how the UN and the World Bank, for example, we are trying to to have the not the same comprehension of the resilience because it depends how how we perceive the the, con the concept of 
of resilience. But yes, we, we, we had a meeting here in Workshot. We worked together and it's, so even though each institution has his own mandate, we're still working together to have, to have this, this broader comprehension on the issue. Thank you, Amadou. Uh, I see uh, Paul and Paul and yeah, only Paul. Okay, go ahead, Paul. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, just quickly to answer to uh, Carol uh, that NIT, the um, uh, Inter-American Development Bank, is an active uh, member of the Climate Security Group and very uh, involved in the dialogue. So, um, so this is very interesting because they have their own unique lens on on uh, the discussion. Uh, unfortunately, World Bank could not join last year. I will get back to them this year and try to have them on board. But what is interesting is that we will have this um, working group um, on the operationalization of the declaration uh, on uh, conflict relief, recovery and, and peace, where the members of the climate security group will have this discussion on, on what works, what doesn't, and what will be uh, the recommendations of the climate security group for the operationalization of this uh, funding in the field. And the um, IEDB will be an active player in the discussion. So um, I think th this will result in some interesting uh, insights or reflections or suggestions. Thank, thank you. Thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. We, we have a minute to go. Um, I, I'm not sure we'll be able to take any more questions. Unfortunately, I do think it's a minute. Am I, am I correct? Um, yeah, yep. yeah, that's yep. correct. Uh, we're supposed to end actually now. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, it's, it's, it's been a fascinating, fascinating discussion. And I think even the last point around the engagement with um, MDBs, IFIs, it's an interesting one that Perhaps as we go into the peace dialogues, that might be one area that we seek to explore, recognizing that in, in many of these areas where there is fragility, where there is conflict and, and the confluence between natural hazard events and climate, there is very little financing um, flowing into, into these issues. And I think you know when you look at issues around um, IFIs, MDBs, et cetera, um, the whole issue around you know, the core business and providing the scaled up financing to address some of these fundamental issues linked to infrastructure, linked to access, linked to good governance. Um, the, the question is, how can we make the cost of that financing such that these countries who are often themselves indebted or have very low GDP to be able to service the, the, the broader source of financing that is required to attack the problem is something that, you know, that confronts them. So with that, let me let me thank um, first of all our our panelists, our main speaker from UNDRR, Ms. Sandra Amlam, and our five discussants who I think did a fantastic job in really bringing not only their years of experience in the field, but really opening um, the the box a little bit on some of the key issues um, around how how we we may be continuing to build upon this. A um, new space of appreciation of the relationships between the two issues, um, the relationship around the fundamental core issues, and as Ahmad, Amadou says, the, the sort of three three elements of strategy. Um, you know, I, I would say practice and 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 culture um, that 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 is at play across across this um, this particular um, topic. Uh, let me thank UNDRR and um, the DPPA. Let me make sure I have it right. DPPA and all of the institutions of the YASC task force that have come together to really bring forward this peace dialogue. I think we need more. Um, we need more. And I think more of this will also help with this journey towards better understanding, better integration, greater efficiency, um, and ultimately, um, the realization of the resilience objective which we're seeking to build. Thank you and um, look forward to seeing you again next time. Thank you very much for the good discussion. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye, -bye. Thank you. Bye, Bye everyone. everyone. See you.